All right, y'all. This is a shorter uh, episode, but it's something that I, I, I've thought a lot about recently that I want to um, almost champion or celebrate like some wins in fishing, okay? All right, so starting, starting from the top, okay? Typically in environmental science, which is what I got my undergrad degree in, I have my PhD in economics, so I straddle this line of being uh, an eternal pessimist and optimist at the same time. It's kind of weird, but that's just kind of where I come at a lot of these ideas. When, when I was studying environmental science, and to this day, if you read environmental science or environmental movement style um, items, there is a latent pessimism and almost doomsday, doomsdayism that says like, we can't do anything, the environmental world is just going to crap, and, you know. It's weird because, you know, the next thing is like, so we should saddle up and do better, but again, the, 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 the start was like, there's nothing we can do, the world's falling apart, okay? And so I, I struggle with this because there are policies and winds um, in the environment that have gone really well. So for instance, banning chlorofluorocarbon, CFCs, these are damaging aerosols that have been linked, or excuse me, were linked long ago to demolishing the ozone layer around the South Pole, right? This was used in refrigerants, aerosols, some other things, and it was well documented that it, it dissolved the ozone, and this ozone hole started to stretch out over the South Pole. It was actually starting to reach Australia, which was kind of linked to skin cancer and some other nasty things. And then we banned these chemicals, and wouldn't you know it, the ozone hole started to shrink and kind of recover. You've never heard this, right? Because that's not really pessimistic. That's not doomsday. There's no like call to action. It's actually like, hey, it's a victory for environmental science. Like, this is a win. Well, I want us to, to step back for a second and think about what are some of the wins that have happened in fishing, okay? What are some economic policies that have done really well and fishing. And, and the biggest thing I want to talk about is what I would call norm development. Uh, the idea that, that over time, uh, the ethics around fishing and the ethics around the outdoors have evolved over time and kind of solidified some, some norms. Okay. And so the first one I want to start off with is probably the best conservation mov movement you've ever heard of because you've never heard it called a conservation movement, bass fishing. Okay. Obviously, I'm from Alabama, um, born in Mississippi, grew up in the South, and you know, first fish I caught was was a brim, and then uh, graduated up to bass. Right now, the thing is, is that for most bass fishermen, whether they're a YouTuber, whether they're a pro circuit, uh, you know, angler who's you know winning millions of dollars in fishing tournaments, or they're just a weekend warrior who's you know ripping a, a rooster tail <laughs> down their local southern lake they all share something in common. After they grip that big bass, right, that big lunker, they do not go and place it on a fillet table. Where do they put it? They put it back in the water, okay? Think about what this means. For the longest time, for hundreds of years, thousands of years, fishing has been about putting meat on the table, right? Sure, it's a good pastime, but it's also like, hey, I've caught this fish, I deserve to cook it. And with bass fishing, right, largemouth bass fishing, the movement, the wheels fell off of this, right, where we started to be like, no, hey, this fish is more valuable in the future if someone else or myself catches it than it would be on my table. This is actually really, really cool if you think about it, right? This means that anglers, right, every time they touched a fish, they said, this fish is more valuable to the community ang anglers and selfishly me one day than it is to fill my belly and put it in the frying pan. Like we need to like raise, you know, raise a banner and say, this is a huge victory for, you know, environmental valuation of fishing resources. But we never did that, right? It was just more of like, yeah, this is what we do in bass, bass fishing, right? Think about this. This is, this is a highly successful conservation movement. We are saying we want to engage and be around these species and put them back in their natural home so that others can enjoy them down the road. We are saying, and if you're ready for this from, from other episodes when we talked about opportunity costs, right? We are saying, like, I am going to give up a really good fried meal. Again, I, I, I like fried bass, sorry. That's, that's where I'm coming at this, right? I'm going to give up a fried meal. I'm going to give up that fried meal because I value 
the future impact, the future ability of this fi fishery more than my frying pan, which is really, really, really cool, right? We, we are, again, uh, the bass movement would never align itself with like as an environmental movement. And I'm not, I guess, proposing that, but it is really cool to acknowledge that thousands and thousands I mean, maybe hundreds of thousands of anglers in the United States have basically locked on without ever having a conversation and said, you know what? We value tomorrow more than we value today. We value tomorrow more than we do today. And we're going to release these, re these resources of these bass to fight another day, right? Again, I'm sure folks will comment and be like, hey, Ben, remember when you toss some fish back, they die. It's like, yeah, but if you put every fish in a frying pan, they all die. So releasing, you know, not, if 90% of fish survive a, a catch and release attempt, that's way better than, you know, 100% of fish going to the frying pan. So again, let's not be pessimist, right? Let's be optimist about some really cool norms that changed. All right, so that's the first one, right? Bass fishing comes around and says, look, this, uh, these species are worth more to us as a community than they are in the frying pan. So what comes next? Fly fishing for trout. Okay, this, this is a, a whole nother group of folks who, who are, are in this movement, right? Trout are obviously very, very good to eat as well, okay? But the, the prevailing norm now, right, is if you are at, even at a tailwater, so think about like a southeastern tailwater. These are non-native brown trout, non-native uh, rainbow trout that are living, I guess, in an unnatural environment. Again, a dammed up water source where there's wa cold water, right? It's pretty unique for fly fishermen to catch and kill big stocked trout in these waterways. Now, spin fishermen, it's a little different, um, but, but overall, folks are, again, releasing these fish and saying, you know, they're more valuable in the future than they are right now, which, again, is a huge win. Peel it all the way back to saltwater, because I, th I think it's like, it's, it's like freshwater, um, saltwater development when it comes to kind of catch and release fishing. I, I don't, again, the history will, will write the record on that. Um, but let's start with one of our favorite fish here at Dorsal, which is tarpon, okay? If you look at old um, images, historical images of tarpon dating back to the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and maybe even on into the 60s, really, um, tarpon were caught in tournaments. Everybody knew they're a trash food fish. They're not good to eat, but people love to keep keep them for a photo, and so they would just drag them on board, kill the fish, and keep them so that they could hang them up at the end of the day and take a picture of it. And again, these fish were either good to hang on your wall or they were destined for the dumpster. Kind of wasteful if you think about it. Um, but that was the prevailing norm. And then again, things start to change and we're, we, we're like, okay, we are no longer fishing for food anymore. And if we're not fishing for food anymore, then maybe we shouldn't just waste dead fish carcasses in a dumpster and maybe we should just release fish. And so within the tarpon community, it evolves that, no, 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 you're supposed to be releasing the tarpon, right? You know, the, I'm thinking about the 80s and 90s, we're still pulling fish on board on the boat to take a picture, but then we're gonna spend a good amount of time reviving the fish and then releasing it back into the environment, okay? Again, a lot of folks now, you know, may want to write in the comments like, no, no, Ben, like that was really bad, right? Dragging fish on board was really bad. I'm going to get to that in a second, I promise. But at that moment, think about it. Going back to our frying pan analogy, right? There are more tarpon surviving being drug on the boat than they are in the dumpster, right? So it's an incremental win. It's not the biggest win, but it's an incremental win, okay? Fast forward uh, to, to modern times where in Florida... Uh, they banned any tarpon that's, that's not medium, excuse me, any tarpon that, that is um, not a baby, okay, so maybe 40 inches and above, you cannot take it out of the water to take a picture with it, right? You have to keep it in the water if it's a big fish to, to, to take a picture of it, which is really interesting because basically the law is going to lead the norm here, right? We have a law that comes from Fish and Wildlife that says you cannot do this behavior, and all the angling community kind of responds what, to what I remember begrudgingly. They weren't really excited about this, okay? But the idea being, again, if it's a small tarpon, you can take a picture of it without out of the water. Big tarpon has to stay in the water. Well, what's cool, what happens next is that a bunch of folks jump on board. So fast forward to today, and what I think is really cool is that this norm is pervasive everywhere. 
If tarpon anglers travel to Belize to fish, what, do, what does Belize do? They follow the ethics or norms of Florida. You don't take big tarpon out of the water. You stay in the water with them. If you go to another country, and again, um, a, a famous YouTuber, Black Tip H, did this themselves. They went to Colombia, where tarpon are actually an invasive species on the Pacific coast. They take a large upper 200 pound tarpon out of the water, drag it onto the boat, and publish all these pictures of like, look how big of a tarpon we've caught, right? And they got skewered on social media, right? Because, right, the norm had been set that you do not take big tarpon out of the water. And as much as it was interesting to watch kind of this war of memes from, you know, both sides, again, as an Alabamian dude who has no, like, again, uh, clout or credibility, I, it just was like, it was kind of interesting to watch. Uh, fun fact, we were actually shooting a film in Columbia at the same time when that happened, and some of the guides like showed us pictures on their phones, like, whoa, look how big this tarpon was. And I was like, and again, for, for the guides, they're like, this is a non-native species. Who cares? Like, drag it on board. If it dies, it doesn't matter. Again, I, I, that pushes against the norm that you don't do this to tarpon. But I, as an economist, I step back and I say, hey, there's something really cool going on here, right? There has been this ethic set by anglers of a behavior we don't do, right? We take care and preserve these species because they have more value, right? They have more value to our community if we release them and we take, care, take good care of them, right? And, and that's the part that I think is really interesting is that now this norm is set so that folks are kind of self-policing uh, how we take care of these species. And they are self-policing in other areas, which means that on net, right, on net, tarpon are being well taken care of across the globe because citizen anglers care about them. That's a huge win, right, for fishing conservation. Last one I want to talk about, which is a species that's another one that's near and dear to, to us at Dorsal, redfish. Um, we love redfish. Again, uh, uh, George uh, says it best. Uh, uh, redfish are, are the most fun sight water eat you'll ever see because their mouth is white and they typically feed up and violently upward, right? Gonna get to eat? Yep, he ate. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Redfishing is kind of this visceral, visual reaction. Well, historically, redfish are really good to eat unlike tarpon. So this is kind of problematic, is that they are delicious, you know, whether you grill them, whether you bake them, blacken, right, all those kind of things. And commercially, because of the popularity of black and redfish, they were almost fished to, a, a, again, a deeply unsustainable point. And, and so Louisiana and some other states put in regulations to protect their redfish stocks so that commercial fishing wouldn't overfish these species. But now something that's doubled down that's more interesting is happening, right? Now anglers value those redfish more as a release species than as a plate species. Now, again, at Dorsal, we've kept a couple redfish that are small because they're tasty. But the thing you won't see people doing is bringing those big bull reds home and saying, I can't wait to fillet one of these up, right? At some docks, that'll get you in a fist fight. Because they're like, look, dude, that fish, that big redfish is going to have worms in it. The meat's going to be trash. And all you've done is kill a great breeding stock redfish. It would be like killing a 16-pound bass. No one would kill a 16-pound bass and fillet it and be like, woohoo, I did something great. Right? People would be like, what's wrong with you? And the same thing we see is this norm development in redfish that big breeding stock redfish are to be protected, treasured, and released. And then if you want to keep a couple small ones for the table, you can do that. Again, it's this transition from a food species that we try to take as much as we can and see what you know, fish and wildlife are watching to now citizen anglers who are in the redfish domain are like, no, 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 we are going to treasure and protect this species because it's ours, right? It's the whole reason that now when uh, like pogey boats, right? These are, these are boats that uh, harvest a, a ton of menhaden on the Louisiana coast, there's now anglers who are pushing back on the regulations of a bait fish because they're saying, hey, that bait fish impacts my redfish and I want us to take care of that, right? Again, this is a huge win for conservation because folks are thinking critically about the species they want to protect and preserve. Again, it's gone from a food fish to a fun fish 
and now we actually preserve it more and more and more. And so to step back here and say, well, what is the economics? This is the fun part to me. When it was just a food fish, we valued that species for daily consumption only at a rate, right? So, so if you could buy redfish at $5 a pound in the grocery store, probably much higher, but maybe say five or $10 a pound. If you keep it, it must have been cheaper than going and buying it in the grocery store, right? Economically, if it was more expensive to go and catch it, you would just go to the grocery store to get it. But instead, you've told me that it's cheaper for you to go and, and fish and catch it yourself. Well, wind this back, right? So these fish, when they were being used as a food fish, we valued them very, very cheaply, right? Monetarily, we didn't put a big price tag on them. Now, right, when we say we want to catch and release it, there's a bigger price tag. We are saying we're going to give up right the cheap food on the table which i talked about earlier right we're going to give up the cheap food on the table for these for these species but also we know there's a huge value for them going forward because they are going to kind of develop into a recreational fishery we treasure and so this is even doubly redeeming because then it's a species worth fighting for it's a species worth calling people's senators and uh, representatives and saying, hey, we want more regulations on the species. Like, wh what a weird world, right? Again, I don't think we champion this enough. Fishermen are now saying, we want more regulations on our redfish because we love this fish that much. We want this protected. We want more regulations on the commercial fisheries that mess with this species. Again, step back. That is a huge win for conservation that no longer, it's just a couple people trying to push some buttons that citizen anglers across the nation are saying, no, 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 we value these species and we want to see them protected. So again, let's celebrate that, keep it moving forward and realize that there's actually some fun economics that's pushing conservation forward.